Okay, so thank you, Federico, for providing some context to this event and helping us understand why we are here. And uh, so a wise man once said, if I've seen further, it was only because I stood on the shoulders of giants. And uh, I hope that after this event, you can all see a bit further. And so we've invited plenty of giants for you to stand upon. And our first speaker is then Paul Cumming. Professor Cumming is a neuroscientist who is using techniques from neuroimagery to better understand the pharmacology of the psychedelic experience. He's currently doing research at the Inselspital, and he's here today to present some of his works. Do you have a watch so that I don't ramble on too long? Okay. <clears throat> ah. Laser, back, forth. I think I can figure this out. There's only three controls. I, I don't think I've ever been called a giant before. Uh, uh, I'm just going to process that for a little while, but thank you. <laughs> and I, I haven't actually much new to relate here because um, uh, the, uh, it's, I'm, I'm fairly, it's fairly recently that I've re been able to, in a position, to re-enter this field, although it's something that's captivated my interest for quite some time. And uh, those of you who were present at, when I gave a very similar talk in Fribourg, uh, some of you, will recognize the, the slide talk and Franz, I believe, will, will invite or will recognize some of his own work, which I'm, I have the impertinence to present, um, and some of the work that I did years ago in Denmark attempting to get at this phenomenon of ayahuasca. And since many uh, the previous speakers have talked a little bit autobiographically, um, just for a moment, I, I, it might be worth mentioning how my, from my point of view, how I came into this field of interest. And, and actually, um, I um, can recognize uh, the recently deceased uh, e. Edward Wilson, the um, zoologist from Harvard, an evolutionary biologist, who, among many books, wrote The Insect Societies, which I read as a teenager and was captivated by learning how uh, insects that are organized in social groups, such as ants and bees, communicate amongst each other using chemical signals known as pheromones, which are essentially neurotransmitters acting at a distance between individuals. And uh, it's perhaps a wonder why I didn't actually become an entomologist, which was my original plan. Um, so uh, just for fun, I had uploaded a selfie to a mushroom identifier app on my phone. And this is really true. I actually did this, it came up as the Spitzkegelier Kalkopf, um, and I'm not sure what the basis of that resemblance is, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and this, of course, is the local um, psilocybin species uh, that can be found uh, by those who are able to recognize such things. I wouldn't rely upon the phone app because it confused me with this mushroom, and. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> But I'm here to talk about the ayahuasca effect um, from a pharmacological perspective. And it's known as a uh, the word from, I forget, Nahuatl language, um, refers to a, um, a ritual usage of two plants, one of which contains the uh, hallucinogen, DMT, and the other containing a monoamine oxidase inhibitor that ostensibly, or in actual fact, um, decreases the metabolism of the hallucinogen, the tryptamine hallucinogen GM DMT, which would normally be rapidly broken down during passage through the gut due to the high activity of MAO in the, in the gut. And so somehow or other, uh, it was discovered um, that uh, amongst all the thousands of plants, I suppose, living in the Amazon, this particular combination uh, had this potentiating effect where the MAO inhibitor in one plant uh, potentiated the hallucinogenic or psychedelic effect of the tryptamine. And these are the two plants that are normally considered to be the essential constituents of ayahuasca, the Banisteriopsis on the top and the Psychotria on the bottom. Uh, I'm assured by uh, my now um, my postdoc, Lana Berlowitz, that uh, the composition of authentic ayahuasca mixtures, in fact, 
differ greatly from one region to another. And so it may be something of a dogma uh, to accept with uncritically the idea that ayahuasca must consist of these two plants or these two constituents, um, which are normally considered to be in the upper figure uh, NN dimethyltryptamine, which is a uh, agonist at serotonin 2A receptors and a few other receptors to a lesser extent. And to this effect, pharmacological effect, is attributed its potential to evoke uh, hallucinations on vision, visual experiences. Uh, augmented, when taken along with the compound in the lower part of the figure, harmine, which is a beta carboline uh, plant metabolite um, formed in quite a number of plants, that has the property of potently inhibiting monoamine oxidase, which would normally uh, break down DMT to such a considerable extent that you could probably eat DMT by the spoonful and almost without effect. Um, that may be a bit of an exaggeration. Um, but a word of caution, the pharmahawaska, the term that was coined by Ott, I guess, um, refers to a synthetic formulation of the presumed active constituents of natural ayahuasca, which is a, a mixture of two or more plants, um, DMT and harmine, or some other MAO inhibitor, because uh, there are reports of people uh, using um, prescription uh, MAO inhibitors instead of the um, harmine. However, it's by no means certain that the authentic ayahuasca must contain both of these compounds, or indeed, if other, it may be that other constituents of these plants, literally, and not meant in any pejorative sense, ayahuasca is a witch's brew of uh, hundreds of compounds, <laughs> uh, and uh, we only happen to know of a few of the ones that uh, are, are attributed the pharmacological effects. Um, and those, the main pharmacological effect is generally accepted to be uh, ag activation at serotonin 5-HT2A receptors, which is a particular subclass of serotonin receptors, which are found in the brain, but especially, here I bore up a figure lent to me by Rupert uh, Lansenberger from Vienna, showing the um, distribution of serotonin receptors labeled in living individuals by positron emission tomography using a serotonin receptor ligand. And uh, we're at the midline of the brain, and so we don't really see the entire pattern of distribution, but I'm sure you will appreciate that it's highly abundant in the frontal cortex and also in the visual cortex, uh, and nearly absent from subcortical structures. And this tells us something right away, I think, about how uh, psychedelic compounds must work at the cortical level by uh, perhaps having their preferential action in brain regions that are particularly enriched in, um, I mean, it's not a, a far stretch to consider that some of the visual effects obtained with hallucinogens have something to do with uh, activating serotonin receptors in the visual cortex. Um, and so here we step really back in time, I think, to one of the first PET scanners, um, uh, which you wore like a hat, and uh, they were quite ugly. They didn't conceal the wiring. And uh, today, the they basically principle is the same, that um, a radioactive drug or substance, um, if uh, administered to the individual, finds itself in the brain and undergoes a particular form of radioactive decay to emit an antimatter electron, a positron, which then annihilates and sends off two very high energy photons or gammas uh, to detectors on one side and the other. And each time two detectors go off in the same instant, that counts as an event. And by counting millions of those events, you can construct a picture showing the distribution of the radioactivity in the brain. And of course, since we're in Bern, we have to mention uh, Albert Einstein, I guess, E equals MC squared, uh, refers to the energy released by the mutual annihilation of an electron-positron pair, which packs quite a punch. It's a gamma ray, and it can pass through your body and through uh, an inch of lead and can be detected by the uh, scanner if it so happens that the decay occurs when your head is in the scanner. So this refers back to one of my first, uh, I guess, flailing efforts in this direction um, that uh, was to um, 
um, label harming, which is the, said to be one of the principal constituents of ayahuasca and is said to act principally as a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, um, could be prepared in the chem radiochemistry laboratory as carbon-11 labeled harmine from a precursor harmol uh, under certain reaction conditions, then furnishing a ligand, a tracer, that could be administered to, well, to people or to, in my case, experience to animals uh, for visualizing the distribution of that tracer in brain. In this case, the distribution should reveal the, the uh, pattern of distribution of monoamine oxidase in brain. And that's, in fact, what we saw. These are pig brains, um, which are roughly like human brains, except smaller. Um, but the basic structures are the same. And we see that in the unblocked condition, the carbon-11 harmine has a high uptake in various regions, including the cortex and also subcortical structures, and that if you pretreat the pigs with something that blocks harmine, another MAO inhibitor that's not radioactive, all that remains is the nonspecific binding. So the top figure minus the bottom figure essentially tells you how much MAO there is in each region of the brain. And you can see that it's moderately abundant also in the frontal cortex where serotonin receptors are most abundant. And um, along these lines, actually, uh, I suppose my point of departure um, for this was this um, early work from the Brookhaven National Labs in, in the United States by uh, Gene Logan, and, um, where they were working with another kind of monoamine oxidase ligand, not harming, but something else, and they inadvertently found that a smoker who was scanned showed very reduced uptake and almost nothing in the brain, uh, indicating that something about that individual, a smoker, a tobacco smoker, uh, had blocked the MAO in their, throughout their body, and they weren't taking any prescription medications that could be account for this. It seemed to be related to their smoking behavior. So, in fact, tobacco smoke contains very high concentrations of harming, the same thing that's in ayahuasca. Uh, most of it is not from the tobacco plant itself, but is formed by pyrolysis, that is, the combustion of the tobacco. Um, is smoking, tobacco smoking, what I call ayahuasca light, spelt with the American spelling, uh, i.e., does MAO inhibition occurring in, as you can clearly see, in the brain of this, this particular smoker, um, does, oops, I got ahead of myself, um, does that actually contribute to the um, pharmacological effect of nicotine, um, uh, perhaps to um, potentiate its reinforcing properties? Definitely, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I, I think there's an emerging consensus that it's not just an epiphenomenon because the fact that there might be uh, harming in tobacco smoke doesn't prove that it's relevant to the action of tobacco smoke, but the arguments can be made that it indeed uh, primes the brain in some way by blocking MAO to quite a substantial extent, uh, comparable perhaps to what uh, is obtained during ayahuasca ritual. So smoking is ayahuasca light. Um, a toad is uh, a heavy, a heavier form of, of this. Um, this is the, um, the Sonoran toad. I guess you've heard of him before. Unfortunately, being driven into extinction, apparently by over-harvesting, uh, let's say. Its skin contains, among other alkaloids, 5-MeO-DMT, um, or uh, uh, bufotenine, and um, this has a, 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 the same, very similar chemistry, chemical resemblance to DMT and uh, that class of uh, hallucinogenic substances. And um, it struck me early on that, uh, uh, you know, never mind the, the details of the structure, but that one could label it here with carbon-11 and then perhaps have an a, a, a instrument for investigating the site of action of this tryptamine in brain by positron emission tomography. And we tried, and this was when I was in Denmark uh, f more than 15 years ago, uh, my chemistry colleague uh, was able successfully to produce this compound by labeling it with carbon-11, which is the radionuclide that produces the PET image, whilst producing the, the, the chemical structure exactly analogous, exactly equal to the natural substance 
from the um, skin of this uh, unfortunate toad. Unfortunate only because um, they're like the bear lauch in Quebec, uh, <laughs> it's being driven to extinction because people like it so much. Um, here in Switzerland, there's plenty of bear lauch, incidentally, but uh, I, it's perhaps best that people don't know how delicious it is. So anyway, um, we test, tested the, this tracer, uh, the 5-methoxy-DMT, labeled with carbon-11 in pigs, and found it had a certain distribution. If you remember, think back to that picture I showed you from Vienna showing the human distribution of serotonin receptors, you immediately see it doesn't match at all. It has the pattern of uptake of this tracer has nothing to do with the serotonin pattern. Furthermore, treating the animals with a well-known blocker of serotonin receptors was utterly uh, unable to displace the binding. So whatever it's sticking to here, I was never able to establish that, is not serotonin receptors. And I had to leave, leave it at that point. Uh, now, some years on, I realized that this pattern of distribution could be dopamine D3 receptors, but uh, unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to pursue that further. So what do we know about the effects of ayahuasca or its constituents on brain chemistry and metabolism? Um, we tried to summarize this in my the group that, uh, my, my micro-ALPS group that uh, um, I have collected since in the past year or so. That also includes uh, Mikkel Palner in, in Denmark, who uh, trained with Gita Most Knudsen and is very interested in this line of research. And, uh, you know, there are several such reviews, but to, in essence, the f general finding is uncontroversial that uh, the main effects of uh, psychedelic compounds can be attributed to serotonin 5-HT2A receptors, plus maybe a few other things. I think of it as like a soup. The main constituent might be potatoes, but uh, the nuanced differences between different uh, psych psychoactive compounds could be mediated by lesser effects uh, at other receptor types, such as 5-HT1A, dopamine, etc. So um, the most classic and best known, uh, best used tracer for brain imaging is, uh, remains fluorodeoxyglucose, which is a radioactive form of glucose. And its uptake and trapping in brain uh, charts out the distribution of cellular activity of metabolism. And these are just happen to be a, a contrast of normal with Alzheimer's patients. But uh, it just shows, serves only to show that uh, this particular tracer doesn't show serotonin receptors, not, nothing of the sort. Rather, it shows through its accumulation in different brain regions the activity of metabolism in that region. And therefore, you can use it as a test bed to see how does drug X alter brain metabolism by looking at changes before and after. And <laughs> this was done uh, uh, years ago, I guess, was it, was it 20, 1998 uh, or something, Franz? Um, and uh, to this day remains, as far as I know, the only such study that has been carried out in humans uh, where to specifically to test the effects of, uh, in this case, psilocybin on uh, brain metabolism in healthy volunteers using the FDG-PET method. And uh, this figure summarizes 97 uh, that the main effect was that rather globally, and you don't need to read the fine print, but throughout all these different brain areas, there was a quite significant stimulation of cerebral metabolic rate as indexed by the uptake of this glucose tracer in the PET scans. And um, I find this extraordinary that no one has followed up on that. We are hoping to. We are, that, that is part of my program here in Bern, and uh, furthermore in rat studies. Um, um, uh, the, um, the much remains to be figured out because, in effect, I, I find it an extraordinary result that uh, 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 this particular drug should so substantially elevate to brain metabolism is in itself an, an interesting phenomenon and begs for further examination, finally, uh, 25 years later. Um, and for, uh, to use yet another slide uh, lent, that was lent to me by um, Boris Kredno, um, from Francis Wollenweider's group. Um, the other aspect that could be explored here, again, for the case of psilocybin, is to look at the occupancy of the drug at the serotonin receptors. And just glossing over it very quickly, they showed uh, more than 10 years ago 
that uh, the intensity of the experience correlated with uh, changes in serotonin binding in perhaps uh, especially the frontal cortex. But as far as I know, uh, there are no other such studies <laughs> that have been done. And so uh, it's the field, you know, and part of this r could be attributed to, I think, the, um, the war on drugs, which defunded this kind of research for such a long time and in so many countries. So I guess, um, am I on time? Have I spoken too fast or too slow? I guess uh, maybe just right? That would be great, because this is practically my last slide, and, uh, and in which I have set this kind of background for what I see needs to be so, some things plucked out of the constellation of what needs to be done to achieve a better understanding specifically of the, the way that uh, DMT and an MAO inhibitor interact in the context of uh, ayahuasca to be studied in experimental animals and in human volunteers using uh, these techniques that I've shown you, uh, FTG-PET to measure glucose metabolism, uh, and um, a serotonin receptor PET to measure the target interaction of DMT at uh, serotonin receptors in living brain, which remains essentially unknown. And by we, I mean this group. Uh, the, the project was actually suggested to me uh, by Chantal, and um, um, was, I was able to obtain funding uh, from the SNF just recently and um, hope to be able to tell you in a few years at the next Alps meeting. Oh, I forgot to mention, you know, the, the map logo actually looks a lot like the distribution of background radioactivity in Switzerland. Uh, I don't know if that's coincidence or not, except it seems should be a hotter because that's where all the granite is. But, Anyway, it, it is a nice logo, and since we're talking about imagery and um, such like, I, I will conclude with this quote from T.S. Eliot, uh, uh, the famous uh, Magic Lantern um, line. If a magic lantern, note 1917, there were no PET scanners then, but uh, there were lantern shows. If a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one should say, this is not it at all, this is not what I meant at all? So, thank you for your attention. So, thank you so much for your presentation. Now, if anyone has some questions, we're here with the microphone. Just raise your hand. Um, this is uh, the first time uh, I hear that uh, tobacco sm or smoke is, uh, acts as a MAO inhibitor. Uh, and this, uh, I find it very interesting because tobacco is so esteemed in the Amazon and, and regarded as, as sort of the, the, uh, the holiest of plants. And I mean, of course, I immediately think if that if the pharmacological aspect of that uh, Contributes to the to its holiness. Do do you have do you know any uh, any or can you well, say something uh, about I, that? I only know what I've learned from from my postdoc Ilana Berlowitz, who has spent some years in Amazonia specifically studying uh, ritual tobacco use, and uh, which is actually more widely used and applied in traditional practice than ayahuasca, yeah. uh, considerably more so. And interestingly, the they don't use the. Uh, species that we consume, but rather, um, uh, uh, what's it called, Nicotiana rustica, yeah. rustica, which is much more potent. It's used to produce uh, nicotine commercially as a herbicide, pesticide, but nobody knows what, what else it contains. So, um, uh, and, but I'm, I'm informed that it's uh, uh, an, considered an important uh, 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 ritual substance in its own right, but is also frequently included inside the ayahuasca mixtures as an additional additive. And so um, really the, the witch's brew uh, metaphor is not so far off. The, there's great potential for interaction between different uh, pharmaceutical substances. Um, uh, a follow up shortly. Could you think if you would smoke enough, that would be enough to sort of uh, uh, do the Maui thing and, and to activate DMT? Well, I, I think we could predict that from that image from yeah. Brookhaven, yes. Yeah. Yes, and I think that uh, there's little doubt that regular smokers uh, are 
experiencing a substantial but not complete uh, blockade of MAOA and B, both forms, in their brain. And that this may, uh, uh, there's theoretical and experimental evidence to suggest that this may potentiate the action of nicotine uh, via its effects on dopamine, because dopamine, like DMT, is a substrate for MAO, both A and B. And so therefore, uh, dopamine and serotonin metabolism has to be different in the smokers uh, due to the effect of the MAO. And if I have just a little bit more time, I would mention, you know, I've only recently uh, become aware of what is well known to more experienced researchers in this field, is that the brain produces its own DMT, normally at very low levels, uh, to the steady state levels couldn't possibly, well, or seem unlikely to be uh, high enough to affect uh, MAO, uh, sorry, um, serotonin receptors, but brain MAO is the enzyme that breaks down brain DMT, the endogenous naturally occurring DMT. Uh, I mean, it's been known actually since the 50s, Julius Axelrod described the formation of DMT in brain, uh, in the mammalian brain. And so I, I suspect that MAO inhibition, either through tobacco smoke inadvertently, through uh, uh, ritual use of tobacco, or through pharmaceutical application of MAO inhibitors as antidepressants, I suspect that there is a significant elevation of brain DMT levels. We're waiting for the results of just such an experiment in rats to see if treatment with harming increased the DMT levels. Very interesting. Thank you. Hello. I recently read in a Canadian journal, I think it was, that uh, psilocybin increases the connectivity in the brain. Connectivity fires the synapses more rapidly, and they think that that's the reason why it has a lasting therapeutical effect. So is that similar as saying brain energy metabolism is increased? Well, the experiment remains to be done. Uh, you would need, I think, ideally a special instrument, which is called a hybrid PET MR machine, to simultaneously uh, collect information in the two channels. Uh, the connectivity data mostly comes from Imperial College, where they used MR to show uh, increased connectivity in the brain. And I think that's, I'm not in a position to explore that, but it's an experiment that begs to be done to simultaneously measure conic functional connectivity changes whilst measuring the effects of, for example, psilocybin or ayahuasca on brain metabolism, because they must be related in some deep way, yes. But I, I don't think any anyone knows the answer yet. Thank you. Well, we have time for one more question. Thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, DMT and harmine are considered to be the effects, the substances causing the effects of ayahuasca, but this is by no means certain. Um, could you tell us something about the other substances that have been considered or are being considered as giving such effects? Um, when you compare different ayahuascas with each, with each other, they often have very different effects, no? Yes. Well, I, I don't know enough about the, um, the results of analytical chemistry. Uh, there is a certain literature on that, um, but, and what it has, sh I, I think it was mentioned in that review article, um, the, the contents of harmine and DMT are extremely variable between batches, depending perhaps on the region and the uh, time of year, because many plants pr that produce alkaloids will crank them out during, apparently even aubergine, um, if grown under drought conditions, is said to cause vivid dreams. I've never experienced that myself, but, but uh, uh, under stress conditions, plants will produce more alkaloids, and that also includes nicotine. Uh, is, uh, it's a response of, to insect predation. So um, it, it's inherently going to be variable. And w we just, uh, yes, there are other 
uh, tryptamines that are present in lesser amounts, and there are other beta carbolines, the collective term for harmine, present in uh, uh, all of these uh, plant products. And um, the, the different proportions, I, I have no doubt, will eventually uh, come to be understood to account for differences in the phenomenology and uh, efficacy of the preparations. But it's, it's much yet to be done, uh, I think, to quantify these, these things. So um, thank you once again for your attention. Thank you.